All right, welcome everyone. Merry Christmas. My name is Dr. Gabe Roberts. I am the quantum chiropractor. We have a lot of great information to cover in today's webinar, which is specifically designed to bring a higher awareness to those who want a better understanding of who they are by learning about the non-physical side of themselves and the limitless capacity we all have. If you ask most people who they are, they'll likely tell you their name, which really isn't them at all. It's their name, something given to them by their parents. You see, the greatest part of who we are is something you'll never see. It's non-physical. And by the end of this webinar, you will have a much greater awareness of this and the power that's all around us, within us, and hear some very fascinating stories. Now, I'm sure that a majority of people would agree that we have this ingenious system that's built within us to keep our body in excellent working order if properly employed. In order for one to take full advantage of this ability, it can only be accomplished by realizing that our bodies are nothing more than a physical manifestation of the higher side of our personalities, the area other word, otherwise referred to as the subconscious mind. Now, before we proceed, I'd like to just indicate that it's important to have an open mind. Ask yourself this question. Can't I enter, can I entertain a new idea? I once heard the best way to describe a person who has an open mind means they're fully ready to throw out some of their most cherished beliefs when a better idea comes along. If you ask yourself this and you don't answer yes to having an open mind, the rest of this information will probably be useless. Now, I'm fairly certain that you know, and I know, that if we're going to improve any areas of our life, we need to have a very open mind. A vast majority of people uh, seem to go back, dragging all their old experiences, habits, and beliefs with them when they are confronted with a new idea, and they ask themselves, you know, does this fit? And if they feel it doesn't, they'll automatically tell themselves it's wrong. So I'd like you to be aware of this, and I'd invite you to instead ask yourself, can this information improve the quality of my life? Or would it make me go in the opposite direction? Now, let's start with a, a little background on who I am. I'm a licensed doctor of chiropractic in the state of Tennessee, a new thought minister, certified functional medicine doctor, a board certified clinical hypnotherapist, self-sabotage coach, and a neuro-linguistic programming practitioner, as well as being a proud husband to a beautiful wife, father to four wonderful children, and a former Marine. And I'd like to shout out to all my children who are listening right now, Jude, Aria, Grayson, and Eland. These various areas of certification basically mean that my primary approach is focusing on the mind, how the mind works, why individuals think certain thoughts, and particularly focusing on the areas of the subconscious or the unconscious mind. After all, it's very important to recognize that if the body is going to be improved in any areas, the mind must be incorporated first, because as previously mentioned, the body is, our physical body is nothing more than an instrument of the mind. Let me say that one more time. The body is nothing more than a physical manifestation of really what's going on inside of our mind. You see, we simultaneously live on three planes of understanding. We're spiritual creatures. We have an intellect, and we live in physical bodies. 
and to master our health, we must become familiar with the non-physical side of ourselves and learn to direct it correctly. Okay, follow me close here. I didn't always approach care this way, as it seems the powers of the mind are overlooked by our current educational system and even considered taboo. In fact, chiropractic college, uh, the one I attended, we briefly were taught that disease only occurs by means of three things, trauma, thought, and toxins. And that was about as far as we ventured into that. Now, of these three, I'm sure that you'll see on this next slide that thought is absolutely the most important one. It's literally impossible to have a sick or diseased body with a healthy mind. If a person is fully aware of this and consciously uses the spiritual side of themselves correctly, they can raise their own levels of consciousness to an area where illness does not occur, bacteria, viruses, and other microbial pathogens do not replicate out of control and even to a level where fire doesn't burn and ice doesn't freeze. These individuals have both achieved higher levels of consciousness through years of training and are able to achieve these states where their physical body is completely unharmed. Wim Hof and sub-zero temperatures to the 1600 degree centigrade hot coals in Sierra Leone, India with this gentleman carrying a child walking on hot coals. The picture you see above that is, of course, a human cell. Those tiny little dots there are all viruses. So if a person is ill, you have to really think about the level of vibration going on, and we'll cover that a little bit more in depth. As I began practicing, I had the privilege of working and learning with several different brilliant mentors whom I would consider some of the absolute best doctors in the United States, if not the world. I've learned valuable information that helped my wife and I build a reputation for having great successes with some of the most difficult cases that a doctor in the field would ever encounter. Uh, many of our clients would have seen on average 12 to 15 doctors before making the trip to come see us. Chronic fatigue, diabetes, autoimmune diseases, fibromyalgia, and a host too numerous to list of mystery illnesses were just a few that we saw on a regular basis. In a very short time, we grew a very successful world-class clinic called Back to Nature Lifestyle Medicine in Kansas City area. Having seen people from all over the world, we experienced great success in helping approximately 80% 80, 80 of our clients with their health challenges by getting rid of stealth infections that had been missed or overlooked by previous doctors, proper detoxification, clearing destructive emotions they were carrying, teaching the importance of healthy habits and eating clean organic food, the importance of definitely eating organic food today, five servings of vegetables daily, clean drinking water, the intelligent use of dietary supplements, and other lifestyle changes such as stress management and exercise. Uh, the other 30%, 25 to 30% of people that were unresponsive to any and all therapies, you know, needed to be further referred to a different clinic for uh, further evaluation. Now, after working for years on thousands of patients, I began to notice a very troubling pattern that caused me to sit back and scratch my head. Within six months, around 65% of the clients who had tremendous improvement began to establish many of the same or similar habits that led to them developing the issue that brought them to us in the first place. They seem to be doing this unconsciously as well. 
almost as if their autopilot uh, was set to live a destructive lifestyle anytime they took the hands off the controls of trying to maintain a healthy lifestyle. You know, this, of course, disturbed me as a practitioner and left me wondering, what did I do wrong or what was I missing? And it, I realized that this was a whole different type of problem than anything I had ever learned about in my studies as a functional medicine doctor and beyond any of the lessons that my mentors had taught me. I began to search for the answers and study, looking for what I was missing until I came across a wise man who said to me, if you aren't happy with the results you're getting, you'll need to learn something about you that you don't know. Uh, this immediately resonated with me and made a lot of sense. So I began to study myself extensively every day for years. In doing so, I began to explore everything I could about the mind, the subconscious, how it's literally responsible for 99% of who we are, why we think the thoughts we think, and why we do the not so good habits we tend to do. And learning about myself, I also learned about other people. Then one day, when I was on a jet returning from Texas, the answer I was looking for dawned on me. All of my clients were looking for an answer outside of themselves, and they'll never find it. The answer is within them. But I didn't know how to bring them to that understanding. Although I was using a variety of wonderful methods, uh, acupuncture, powerful flower essences, emotional freedom techniques, otherwise known as tapping, meditation, breathing techniques, emotional clearing techniques, as well as other ways to resolve their stress, it, the results were always short-lived. I would clear something out of a person like uh, resentment or guilt. These are very destructive re uh, emotions to be carrying you know, during a treatment session, and it'd be replaced by something else, just as destructive by their next appointment. And it dawned on me, this was all because I was never able to provide a blueprint for them to understand how their mind works and how to bring order to their mind. And we will cover this in more details, as well as proven strategies in depth in our next webinar, Mastering Your Mind. Today's just to kind of give you an introduction to the spiritual side of ourselves. Okay, what's really important to understand is that most people look outside themselves for the right answer. If I take this drug, I'll be better. If I exercise, then I'll feel good about myself. If I use the right supplement or I take the right vitamin, then I'll be healthy. If I read the right book, if I hire the right coach, if I go to the right seminar or go to the right doctor, then I'll be better. If I use this technique or, or use this device, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And this is the thinking process for 95% of the people today. And it sometimes does improve their issue you know, for a short period of time. Sooner or later, they're right back to square one and their issue, interestingly, shows up in another form. A whole new symptom arises. If their back stops hurting, now their stomach hurts. If their stomach stops hurting, now their knee hurts. You know, it arises somewhere else, a, a bit similar to one of those whack-a-mole machines that you can hit the mole and it pops up somewhere else. Now, this certainly isn't the case for everyone. There are few exceptions, but this is far the majority of people today. They aren't taught to look inside themselves. And the truth is we have the answer inside. We have the answer to achieve anything far beyond what we've ever been told to believe. We have tremendous potential that never gets utilized. If we used our body like we use our mind, we would only wiggle our little finger. Now, once I began to incorporate this approach in clinical application by introducing to my clients the higher side of their personality and the non-physical side of who they were, 
my results not only improved to a greater percentage, closer to 99 instead of 80, but the clients were forever transformed and never again followed the path that led them to the disastrous consequences that brought them into me initially. Uh, for example, I have seen many patients prescribed antidepressants, and that's S as in several, for most of their life, quickly resolve their depression within weeks to a month after some very targeted subconscious work using various methods, hypnotherapy, and giving them a specific blueprint on how their mind works and how to control their emotions. It's also very noteworthy that these improvements occurred long after the functional medicine approach to mood support and neurotransmitter improvements with supplements such as 5-HTP, GABA, high-dose omega-3s, and many others completely failed or offered minimal improvements. The truth is, from research today, whenever a person truly believes something and they understand, they grasp it, your body can make at least 150 known pharmaceuticals. So if there's 150 known, how many is, is there unknown that we don't know about? Fascinating. Now, let's look at this uh, analogy that I think will make you grasp something a little deeper. Uh, this is for people that have been to Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, I've been there myself. Have you ever seen or heard of the Golden Buddha statue in the temple? It's one of the very few uh, major tourist attractions that are commonly seen. Uh, there's several different Buddhas, an Emerald Buddha, um, including the Golden Buddha. This statue is 10 foot tall and weighs in at over five tons of solid gold. Now, the gold value alone is worth $250 million, not counting the artistic value nor the historical value. And the history of this golden statue is very interesting because in 1953, they had no idea it even existed. You see, they were in the process of relocating a, a large clay Buddha uh, from one side of Bangkok to the other in order to make, road uh, to make way for a road that they were going to uh, put in. And during the process of this, a crane that was lifting the clay statue uh, the harness malfunctioned in a way and it was positioned and it caused a large crack to form in it. This caused the head operator of the crane to cautiously stop the moving process and lower it down to the ground. Uh, from there, they were going to examine it, you know, further to see uh, how much damage was actually done. It began to rain uh, shortly afterwards, so uh, they covered it in a large tarp uh, to keep it from getting worse. Later that night, a crew member came out and shined his flashlight on it to see if it was staying dry. And something deep from inside this clay statue uh, reflected back from inside the crack. He realized that clay doesn't reflect light like that. So he realized there must be something else inside of it. So he got permission. And the next morning, a crew chipped away all the surrounding clay. And sure enough, there was this golden Buddha inside of it. They further did a little research and found out why it was covered in clay. And the best theory that they could find was 300 years earlier, when the Burmese people were attacking Thailand, uh, the monks of the monastery covered up the golden Buddha with clay so it would appear worthless and they wouldn't steal it. They also believed that the monks were all killed in this massacre and the secret actually died with the monks. Later, it was rediscovered. That's an interesting word, right? Discover, you know, meaning what exactly? Take the cover off, right? It was always in there, but they had to take the cover off, uh, revealing the treasure inside of it. So where's the point I'm leading to? It's a metaphor that we use in the approach of care that we aim for. When clients come to us, see us, they have this cover of clay that consists of deep, negative beliefs in their subconscious mind, beliefs of self-doubt or, or fear, their sense of guilt or shame or resentment towards someone who wronged them in their life, a parent or a previous spouse. It could be from trauma or abuse that occurred in their childhood, leaving them feeling like they aren't worthy or 
aren't enough. These deep-rooted feelings are the triggers or catalysts that lead to depression later and ultimately the development of disease. So our approach is simply to remove the clay so this golden essence begins to shine. If there's challenges as stealth infections, viruses, parasites, bacteria such as Lyme, we do use intelligent frequency match protocols to get them under control, but we also acknowledge and fully understand that these are only symptoms and not the root cause of any illness. The, the root cause, which made the individual vulnerable in the first place, was the clay that they were carrying with them. Now, let's go into a little bit deeper look at this golden shining essence we all have. Today, there's two contrasting ways of looking at reality. One is the materialistic way of defining who we are. And that states that consciousness is a product of brain biochemistry and electricity. And this is the dominant view in our current medical system today, institutes, mainstream science. And the emphasis here is that we are just physical bodies and mechanistic medicine is the only kind that really works. That's why governments only fund research into mechanistic medicine and ignore complementary and alternative therapies. You know, they're viewed as uh, something that can't possibly work because they're mechanistic. They're, or, I'm sorry, because they aren't mechanistic. But they appear to work because the people would have gotten better anyway or because of the placebo effect. The placebo is, you know, when a healing occurs, uh, mediated by a belief that's unmixed with direct effects of treatment. So the view is that this is the only kind that really works, this mechanistic medicine. This is the default worldview that's held by almost all educated people over the world, is the basis of the educational system today, natural health service, the medical research council, and all governments. Over a hundred years of research into this, and the results are there's no evidence today that solidly proves that we're nothing but a physical body. Yet, this remains the default worldview. And the other view to consider is that we're a spiritual being connected to everything around us and that our brain is a receiving apparatus from a greater consciousness that exists beyond our physical bodies and that this consciousness is a primary force within all things a plant, a rock, even wo running water in a stream. And perhaps this primary consciousness existed before matter and organized matter into forms that are more and more able to experience themselves. Now here's where we begin to see a large body of evidence that demonstrates that there is more to us than we are aware of. And this lack of awareness is without a doubt a barrier preventing an individual from fully experiencing everlasting health, happiness, and well-being that's fully available to them. So let's look at some interesting pieces of evidence and just give us a hint at this universal connection that we all share. Uh, years ago, before the Second World War, uh, there was a study conducted by a professor at Harvard named William McDougall. He wanted to examine rats, and uh, he wanted to see if they could learn quicker than what their parents have learned. So he basically trained these rats to escape from a water maze. Uh, you know, they had to swim around in this maze, and there was two exits for them to escape out of. One of them uh, was the wrong exit, and it had a light in it. And if the rat went that way, there'd be a mild electric shock, uh, while the right exit to go out of was actually dim and there was no electric shock it was just a simple way to escape the maze so he tested them to determine how many trials they made before they learned to you know get out of the dimly lit exit and the first generation of rats as you can see from this chart it, it took around 200 trials before they learned 
the only exit to go out of is the one that's dim. That way they don't, they, they caught on that they're, you know, not getting shot. And then he examined the offspring and it took about 180. And then the next offspring took around 150. As they seem to improve the following generations learning this maze quicker. Now, at first he assumed that it was uh, something being passed on in the offspring through modifying the genes uh, what we call epigenetics or an inherited characteristic of some sorts. Uh, during this time in the 20th century science, there was crude understandings of this kind of thought process that could even take place of genetic passing from one parent to another. So, uh, you know, many people began to question his findings. However, since he had a really good reputation and he was a Harvard professor, uh, the scientist who wanted to explore his findings to see if his effect was indeed authentic, if it could be reproduced. Uh, so other studies started to take place, uh, such as University of Edinburgh in Scotland and in Melbourne, Australia. And what they discovered when they began to train their rats, their own rats was very shocking. You see, their rats began to learn the water maze in numbers that matched the last group that Harvard left. So Harvard reached a certain number, and when they start in Australia, those rats again immediately begin uh, showing those kind of numbers. Um, but if that wasn't already fascinating enough, Melbourne produced even more stunning results when the rats not only continued to improve in their numbers of generational learning, but rats of all that particular species uh, without their parents ever even being introduced to the water maze. Uh, so it had nothing to do with modifying the genes. It had nothing to do with epigenetics or passing down of inherited behaviors. There was something else much more mysterious and fascinating going on. And it is my understanding from the research that I've done that this kind of occurrence is not unique to rats at all, but all biological beings. Uh, you'll see in the ebook of this presentation, I've listed over half a dozen of other very intriguing scientific examples of this connection, this spiritual connection that is ethereal and lies with all of us uh, biological beings. In fact, something known as the Akashic Records is an ancient concept that suggests that the entire Knowledge of the universe is contained in one unified field, and every biological entity can gain access to it uh, through subconscious training and using the mind correctly. It's possible to use this great power, as we saw in previous examples of superhuman feats. What modern research does tell us is quantum physics, uh, that the entire fabric of space itself is made of energy and information which is propagated to the universe through waves called quantum waves. Now, these are common to all intelligent life, which means that all of us as humans and life as we know it are tapping into this uh, similar quantum waves. In other words, we are all receiving messages from the cosmos. And although these quantum waves are directed at our brains, as we'll learn shortly, we have the ability to direct those waves any way we choose. And when used appropriately, can be used to improve our lives for fantastic results. So to do this, let's briefly explore the concept of psychoneuroimmunology, which was coined by Norman Cousins. And it deals with how your psyche or, or your mind overall attitude affects your nervous system and ultimately affects your immune system. There's a large collective body of evidence today that suggests that higher vibration, the higher vibrational your thought pattern is, such as being positive and optimistic, expressing gratitude, the better in terms of positivity, expectations, and joy, the better off your immune system is and the less vulnerable to illness you are. And there's a major diminishing in the chance of developing disease. Uh, it's also pointed out that if an illness does occur in a person that's optimistic all the time, and the illness will be very, very short-lived. So let's just become fully aware of how powerful our thoughts are.
did you know that your body is a vibrating mass of energy? It actually glows. Your, your body is a vibrating mass of energy and the aura that surrounds our bodies uh, is actually something that can be photographed, uh, taken a picture of. Uh, you, Simeon Crilly in the 1920s actually developed a way of taking a picture of the body and he can take a picture of anything. This, this essence comes off of everything. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's very beautiful. And what's fascinating is the thoughts you think affect how bright and symmetrical this glow is. And you can feel this around people. Someone that we have been around that we think is always lucky. They always win. Well, their vibration is higher. They have a fantastic inner dialogue and their color would be bright and beautiful for someone who is full of anger and things like that. They're going to be, um, you know, they're going to be a lot less symmetrical according to this picture. So uh, some of you might be familiar with Dr. Uh, Masaru Emoto. Okay. He proved that thought energy uh, focused towards water actually changes the molecular structure of the water. So he would have students send negative and positive thoughts towards a container of water, such as you fool, or I hate you. And then they would take the water and freeze it at 20 degrees below uh, zero and put it in a petri dish and observe it under a microscope. And as the water begins to melt, it forms these beautiful crystals. And if the thoughts were positive energy, uh, like love and joy, gratitude, and things like that, it forms these really beautiful uh, snowflakes. Um, as you can tell, the uh, negative thoughts towards it were very unsymmetrical blobs and malformations such as this. And you can see in this picture here, it says water before and after a Buddhist prayer. Now, I do want to point out this is using effective scientific prayer, how to pray effectively. Uh, most of us are, are conditioned to pray wrong. Um, and I'll be going over that in later videos, how to pray effectively, scientifically, through using the right verbiage, the right vibrations, and to uh, achieve fantastic healings. So let's just take this into consideration. If this is 75% water, I'm sorry, if, if our bodies are 75% water, you know, we should be 80%, but most of us don't drink enough. So 70 to 75% water, and our thoughts are directly having a vibration, you know, you really have to think about what our inner dialogue is. What are we saying to ourselves constantly? What kind of vibration are we in? And for an individual to obtain optimal health, it's vitally important to understand this concept. Every thought you send is a vibration that has a direct impact on how harmonious your cells function. And if that's not enough, uh, listen to this story. Uh, let's explore thought power in another example. Uh, Cleve Baxter uh, was a former FBI agent, and he was America's most trusted polygrapher at the time. He had a school where he taught uh, law enforcement and security agents all over the world, and he would teach them the art of lie detection, uh, lie detecting uh, skills and abilities to body language and things like that. One day, just an idea in his head, he decided to put his plant on a lie detector test. So he hooked what's called a dracinium plant up to probes on a uh, lie detector test. And he wanted to see if he could get his machine to register at all. So he dipped the leaves in hot coffee and nothing happened on the machine. He kind of stepped back and thought, well, if, I, if I'm gonna use this on a person, I have to threaten their well-being for it to really register. So he decided, I'm going to up it a bit, and I'm going to burn one of the leaves. The minute he thought, pictured a flame in his mind, before he could even reach for a match, the machine jumped wild. So again, this proves two things. Plants are connected to that same field that the rats were, okay? And I've, I can go for hours on this in great detail. We don't have time for that tonight. But plants are connected to that field, but also what our thoughts do. He sent a signal out to that plant, instantly got a flame in his mind, and the plant registered. Now, of course, some people will hear this and think that's ridiculous because that's what happened to the Mythbusters, the popular scientific show. 
So the Mythbusters decided to reproduce this and they got a polygraph test. They actually got the same planet Dracinium and believe it or not, they produced the same results and they went from skeptic to complete believer. And feel free to watch that on YouTube. Pretty easy to assess that. And again, it lets you know how powerful thought energy is. Another very, very intriguing um, study on intentions and thoughts and things like that uh, showed a French researcher named Dr. Rene Poche and his experiment with baby chickens. Okay, this is a PhD. Um, and if you look at picture A here, you'll see that there is a line just kind of drawn all over the place, you know, just a pin that just kind of touches all over the place. What happened was he made a random event generator, okay, a little robot with two wheels, and it just, uh, it rolled all over the place. It was designed to 50% of the time go right, 50% of the time it'd go left, just roll all over the place, and that's what you're seeing in picture A. Also note that there's an empty cage uh, next to that picture. So this test was specific for studying intention. What he did then was he put baby chickens in with this robot that had never seen their mother. Okay. And of course, baby chickens and baby ducklings, uh, the first moving object they see when they hatch out of an egg uh, is they believe it's their mother. So you know, he took baby chickens that had never seen the mother. They go into this arena. They see this moving robot and instinctively they put an intention toward this robot. It's their, that it's the mother and they start following it around. You know, the robot goes right and the baby chickens follow it right. It goes left. The baby chickens follow it left. Then what he did was he took the baby chickens out and set them in a cage next to the robot. What happened after that is shocking. And you see that in picture B. The robot no longer rolled around all over the arena randomly. This time, this robot stayed very close to the baby chickens, almost like the intention of the baby chickens completely changed it. And that's exactly what happened. I have published peer-reviewed literature today that states how consciousness and emotions and things like that actually will change matter. So what you think about and what your focus is through the day is very important. Fascinating, just showing the power of intention. So this kind of goes into, you know, as we've explored this field of energy and the vibration that interacts with us, and every living creature, whether it's a rat, a plant, a water, a baby chicken, or us, you really should start to appreciate this non-physical spiritual side of yourself that is denied you're not told about we're never taught about it schools don't teach about this and understand this is where our true potential lies in order to heal ourselves in profound ways if we are just physical bodies which the world will have you try to believe uh, there'd be a limit to what we could do uh, you know there's a limit at this desk i'm sitting at right now if I pile on too much weight, it actually crushes under it and collapses. But we're far from knowing the limits of our potential. I'm sure that most of us have heard of stories of mothers and frantic moments. They get in a car accident and they can open a door that's mangled or they can you know, pull the car off of their child. You see, there's just unlimited potential in us. What about running a four minute mile? running a mile in under four minutes, something that's been tried for thousands of years. And, uh, you know, uh, I've heard that the ancient Egyptians used to release a lion on a person. So they would try to run a four minute mile and they still couldn't. Um, the experts said it couldn't be done. They said our bodies weren't strong. Our cardiovascular system couldn't do it. But in the summer of 1954, a man named Roger Bannister stopped believing everything. He started believing in himself. He used that spiritual side and he ran a four minute, he ran a mile in under four minutes. So who knows what the limit is to us? The power that I'm talking about can be used in one of two ways. You want to really recognize that it can be used to cause misery, depression, 
and disease if it's used incorrectly and by not understanding the laws of the mind you'll just do that uh, similar to neglecting a garden uh, you know we'll have you you'll, you'll grow weeds if you neglect a garden but it can also be harnessed and productive and focused to heal beyond any measurable means today exploring archives of history i have read about phenomenal healings around the world in hundreds of cases that I'll be sharing with you in detail later. So it all depends on how you use it. Now, I'm going to give you a closer idea of what that looks like in each case. This is a classic story that comes from a newspaper long ago. It involves a railroad employee in Kansas. He was working late and during the close of the day, he accidentally locked himself in a refrigerator car and he wasn't able to escape. He pounded and pounded on the walls of the car to attract attention and no one was around. So it was near the end of the day and everyone had left. So remember, he trapped himself in a refrigerated car on a train. Um, couldn't get the attention of anyone else. So the man finally gave up and resigned himself to his fate. Sometime during the night, as he felt his body becoming numb, he began to scribble sentences on the wall of this car. And some of these sentences captured his very last sensations he experienced. As he moved closer to death, of these, the first sentence read, I'm becoming colder. And another sentence later continued, still colder, nothing to do but wait I'm slowly freezing to death, half asleep now, I can hardly write. These may be my very last words, which in fact they were. On the following day, the workers returned and opened the refrigerated railroad car and they found him dead. But let me tell you something about this story that's startling. The freezing mechanism on this refrigeration car actually was malfunctioning and wasn't operating for several days before this incident. Believe it or not, the temperature had not dropped below 50 degrees the entire night. And he was in the, the entire night he was in the car. So in other words, this man became a victim of his own illusion. He had presumed his time had come and his life was over when in fact there was no need of that presumption at all. Now, I want you to stop and think about that. If you just look around today, you see a lot of that going on in our lives today, don't we? So this quote really describes the impact of this story and how we can relate it to our own lives. We, mis we misread the signs of our predicaments. We presume that things are worse than they really are. So, like this man, we too become victims of our own illusion. We die, if you will, even though the temperature of our own circumstance never even came close to freezing. Now you see this man, he used his higher side of his personality and let the full force of his subconscious mind, and he used it incorrectly. He let what he thought were his circumstances control his way of thinking and guide that power in a negative direction, and that gave him the sad and unfortunate results he got. Now, very briefly, we're almost finished here. I want to share with you a story of a man who used the same power correctly. Let's look into R.G. Hammer. Dr. R.G. Hammer was a German doctor who ran a practice in Rome. A good doctor, a clean bill of health, very healthy, no ailments, no conditions. Then a tragic incident occurred in his life when a 17-year-old son was actually shot and killed during the holidays, and this uh, left him emotionally devastated. Shortly after, he found out he actually developed testicular cancer, and despite the clean bill of health before the event, he began to research histories of patients with cancer and see if they had experiences of shock or emotional turmoil or distress in their life previously. 
after he extensively researched this on thousands of patients, he concluded that the disease is brought on when the person has an emotional upset or experiences a mental traumatic shock, which they never mentally are able to recover from. Once his emotional distress was resolved, his body had a full recovery and returned to normal, and his cancer actually disappeared. His conclusion after 20 years of research and therapy with over 31,000 patients was firmly established of how biological conflict within the mind, like emotional shock and destructive thought patterns, result in cold, cancerous, nephrotic growths. And if the conflict is resolved, if the conflict in the mind is resolved effectively, and which I will say it needs specific training, a lot of people are not able to do this on their own for sure. The cancerous and necrotic processes are reversed and the body begins immediately to repair the damage and return the individual to a perfect state of health. 31,000 patients, 20 years of research. That's fascinating. Now, of course, there's more to the story. He had proven this over and over. He presented this conclusive work to the university he was affiliated with, and they told him to deny his findings. Now, I'm not here to discuss any politics. I'm sure we're all uh, secretly thankful for that. But you get the point. When there's conflict in the subconscious mind, it blocks this universal power that we see in all things. There's a ton of evidence for that from working its magic and helping us live vibrantly. It puts our body into a very chaotic vibration. The subconscious mind is without a doubt the most powerful side of ourselves and it must be used correctly. In my next webinar, Mastering Your Mind, we'll look at the blueprints of the mind and introduce some powerful proven techniques on how to unlock the true potential that awaits. Merry Christmas, and thank you all for joining me tonight.